Mr. Studer shared five things. This must be a five-point night because I got five things I want to share with you tonight. And it's all about, as Quint talked about, relationships. Relationships so very important. Paul is coming to the conclusion of his first letter to the church at Corinth. And in verses 13 and 14, we're going to read together in just a moment uh, this concluding thought in just a nutshell, that that he speaks to this church. But before we get to it, the context is all in relationships. When you look up in verse 10, he talks about Timothy. Now, you know Timothy. Timothy was the young man who followed Paul. Paul chose him. He left and came with him. It's his relationship. Paul changed his life. When you get to verse 12, it talks about Apollos. If you know your Bible, you know Apollos. Apollos is that man that that Paul met, and he was mighty in the Scriptures, but he only knew the baptism of John until Aquila and Priscilla introduced him to the baptism of Christ. Still, Apollos was mighty, mighty in the Scriptures. You come on down a little farther, and you find Stephanus. He's in verse 15. Paul said in another place that he baptized Stephanus. You walk a little farther uh, into the text, down in verse 17, and you find Fortunatus. If you have a son, don't name him Fortunatus, all right? (laughs) He finds Fortunatus. He's he's one of those young men coming along. And then Acacius is also found in verse 17. But all five of these men, Paul said in verse 18, they have refreshed my spirit. That's what Quint Studer did for me tonight. He refreshed my spirit. I walked down the halls of Pisgah Elementary and junior high and high school, Northeast State Junior College. Man, I named some names tonight while he was naming those teachers. Those were those teachers that poured in to me. They refreshed my spirit. Ms. Hutchison, mm, boy, she poured into me. I got to Paul Cooley. He poured into me. He refreshed me. He's my high school basketball coach and civics teacher that set us down in the middle of the Jesus movement civics class and took the civics book and put it aside and said, we'll get to civics in a moment, but boys and girls, we've got to talk about what it is God's doing on the campus of this school. He go to jail for that today, but in the late 60s, early 70s, you could still do it. Well, I began to be refreshed. Thank you, Quint, for speaking in our hearts tonight. That's what these five men did for Paul. They refreshed him. That's why we gather men here, so you'll get to know some people in in a way that you've not known them before, so that there'll be a refreshing, a refreshing, as he says in verse 18, they have refreshed my spirit and yours, he said to the church at Corinth. What did these five men do? Well, we find it in verses 13 and 14, and it'll come up on the screen. I want you to see this text. Here's what Paul is saying to them, and here's what he's saying to us tonight. Five simple exhortations from the apostle Paul, where he says these words. Why don't you just read these out loud with me, these two verses. Here we go. Be on the alert, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong, let all that you do be done in love. 1 Corinthians 16, verses 13 and 14, he gives us those five simple biblical exhortations. And I just want to look at those for a few minutes with us tonight as men that will refresh one another. And then we will refresh those at our homes and in our jo- on our jobs and wherever we may be. Let's look at these five exhortations. Number one, Paul said, be on the alert, be on the alert. Uh, That means to watch, to be awake. No vacation from your vocation. And I'm not saying you don't take a vacation. I have a vacation time. I take that. 
Matter of fact, the church here, by my 25th year, has given me a, a, a trip uh, to study the Great Awakenings. And uh, we've got that set here for late in the summer where we'll uh, go to London and go to Normandy and then we'll go up through Scotland and Wales and we'll, we'll see all those great places of the uh, spiritual awakening time and the uh, Reformation and all that. We'll, we'll have a vacation, but, but you still don't take a vacation from your vocation, that that God has called you to. If you're a father or a husband, you, you don't have a vacation from that. Sometimes you go on vacation with people, but he's saying, stay on the alert. Matthew 26, 20, you remember, Peter, James, and John, Jesus said, y'all, you'll stay right here for a few minutes, and I'm going to go right over there and pray. And so Jesus goes to pray, and he comes back, and he finds them sleeping, not praying. He goes away again, he comes back, and finds them sleep twice. He says, could you not watch with me for one hour? Couldn't you just stay for an hour. Need to watch. Watch. Scripture tells us to watch for some things. Number one, watch for every opportunity that God would bring your way. Watch for every opportunity. I had opportunity. I've shared with the church a little bit, and it's been kind of floating around on Facebook in different times last Saturday night, uh, that an opportunity just fell in my lap uh, to speak to some people. Out there. you got to watch for those opportunities. When they come, you got to let God give you courage to take the opportunity. Watch for opportunities. You never know when God's going to place an opportunity right in front of you. Number two, watch for danger, the scripture would tell us. There's some things you need to stay away from, some dangers to get away from, to step out beside and say, that's not a good place for me. I was down at, uh, several years ago, I was at a hockey game, and I was, in between second and third period, I went in the bathroom, and there's a gentleman standing at the urinal in front of me, and just about to be his turn. And just as he stepped up to the urinal, he turned around to me to hand me his beer. <laughs> and he says to me, would you hold this for me? I said, uh, no. Because uh, I, I, I knew. I mean, just as soon as I took that, yeah. <laughs> my deacon chairman was walking in there, I guarantee you. You know, I, that, that wasn't good for me, all right? Or this guy from the news journal, he's, you know, he's coming around the corner. You, you got to watch. Watch. There, there's some things you don't need to be involved in, and you need to be wise as a serpent, harmless as a dove. Watch for an opportunity, watch for danger. But what the Word of God tells us to watch for more than anything is watch because your Redeemer is to return. We were just singing about it. He's coming again. Jesus came the first time. I'm telling you, he's coming again. Jesus promised it. And if you're trusting Jesus to take you to heaven, you can trust every word he said. And he said, keep your eye on the eastern sky because I am coming again. We work like he's never coming, but we trust like he's coming before this meeting is over. Watch, watch, watch. Be on the alert. Watchful. Awake. No vacation from your vocation. Be on the alert. Secondly, uh, in this text, he says to stand firm in the faith. Stand firm. As not to waffle. Firm. Well, the scripture tells us to stand firm in several things. In, in the book of Galatians chapter 5 verse 1, it says to stand firm in your liberty. Well, you've been given liberty. It was for the freedom of Christ that set us free. Therefore, standing firm, do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. He tells us to stand firm in liberty. Philippians 1, 27, he tells us to stand firm in one spirit. Only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ so that whatever, whenever I come... See you, remain absent. I will hear that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. As a matter of fact, let me just parenthetically say that, that on this one spirit, we need to stand together, one spirit. There are many of you that are here 
the great majority of you, of course, from Olive, but many of you are guests. Some of you don't have a church, and we want you to consider making Olive your church. Others are from other churches. I want to encourage you to encourage your pastor to come back and join us right here in this building, in this place, on Palm Sunday night, the 20th of March. Uh, Joey Rogers at the Pace Assembly of God, along with myself, we'll go public with this next week. Uh, we're going to have a prayer meeting and a call for spiritual awakening invite all of our christian brothers and sisters in churches to come in one spirit right here united in prayer together we'd encourage you to be a part of that as we come together in one spirit uh, we'll have to tie brother joey down but we're, we're going to have a good time together that night and it's not a preaching deal we're not going to be speak. We're going to be praying. There'll be five calls to prayer that night as we come together. The Bible says we stand firm in liberty, stand firm in one spirit. Philippians 4, 1 says we ought to stand firm in the Lord, in the Lord. Therefore, my beloved brethren, whom I long to see my joy and crown. In this way, stand firm in the Lord. Be in the Lord. But in our text tonight, he does not say stand firm in liberty or spirit of the Lord. He says stand firm in your faith. Gentlemen, I'll ask you a question. You take me to a place and tell me of a time when by faith you ask God to be your Savior, step out of heaven, step into your heart, draw a line and say, I became a Christ follower at this point as Jesus walked along the seashore and said, Peter, come and follow me. Zacchaeus, come down out of that tree today. I'm going home with you. Can you take me to a place and tell me a time when you got out of your boat or out of your tree or out of whatever you were doing and said, today I'm going to follow Christ. If you've never followed him, I'd encourage you to follow him tonight. Let tonight be the day you, you draw that line and step across it. Those of you that hear me often know my testimony as a 10-year-old boy and I gave my heart and life to Christ. My daddy at 23 when he had just gotten out of Korea he gave his heart and life to Christ. My granddad at 65, when he asked Christ to come into his heart, he stood firm in the faith. I know many of you, and I can take you to the time because I was there with you when faith became a reality in your life. That you drew a line, stepped across and said, today is the day that I put my faith in. Now he says, stand firm in that, but don't move in that. Stand firm in faith. Matter of fact, Hebrews says that, that without faith, it's impossible to please God, not only in your salvation, but, but in your walk with God. You have to stand firm. You walk not by sight. You walk by faith. Things you can't even see or know that you know God's directed you to do, and you walk by faith in it. Be on the alert. Number two, stand firm in your faith. Tonight, if you've never put your faith in Christ, I want you to know God loves you. He gave his life for you. Forgot to look tonight. Yeah, that glass is lit up. It's the greatest teaching tool I have in this church is that stained glass. A man came to this church and he polled us 20 years ago before we built this building. He said, Pastor, we're going to see what's the heart of your church. And when he came back to me, he said, the cross is the heart of Olive Baptist Church. But he said, not just the cross. He said, there's an evangelistic message that comes through. And he said, we're going to put the cross of Christ, but we're going to put a cross on either side. And we're going to put a shaft of light on one. And we're going to make one dark. And he, I said, yeah, I know the message. There are a thousand stories in that glass from creation to Gethsemane to New Jerusalem but the center part of that is there were two malefactors that died with Christ the day he died. One cross is in the shadow. That's the malefactor, the thief that said, I will not believe. The one on the other side where the shaft of light is coming down is the one that did believe. Everybody in this room is one of those two. Now, don't be so full of yourself you think you're the guy on the center cross. We know who died there, amen? Amen. Christ died for us and we died as malefactors next to him, either believing or not believing. The question has to be answered tonight, which one are you? Stand firm in the faith. One man said, you saved others, save yourself, save us, come down off of here. The other man said, Lord, tonight, today, remember me when you enter paradise. If you've never put your faith and trust in Christ, I pray you do it even right now while I'm talking to you. You say, how do I do that? Just call on him. Call out unto the Lord.
Be on the alert. Stand firm in faith. There's a third word here. The King James uses an interesting phrase. It says quit, Q-U-I-T, quit ye like men. The New American Standard I'm reading from tonight says act like men. Act like men. It's why this is a great men's conference passage. What he means is grow up. When you go to 1 Corinthians 3, 1, Paul said, I couldn't speak to you in the beginning as mature men because you were babes in Christ. You were infants. You were sophomoric. Uh, my favorite word in the English language. You were sophomores. You were wise fools. You were like babes. But now it's time to grow up. Act like men. And just because somebody looks at you as a coach would look at you and say, be a man, that, that doesn't mean you've grown up. You, you got to have maturation. You, you must grow. What will cause a believer to grow? I believe you need three things to grow. Number one, you need a Bible to read, a place to pray, and a friend to talk to. You need a Bible to read. You ought to be a daily Bible reader. You ought to read this book every day of your life. Read Proverbs. It's a great place to begin. If you're not a Bible reader, 31 chapters in Proverbs, one for every day of the month. If it's the 27th day of the month, just read the 27th chapter. It'll run you right through. Proverbs, great place to start. If you're a new believer, read in John. Just read the Word. You need a Bible to read. Secondly, you need a place to pray. I have a brand new place to pray at my house. I've made me a literal prayer closet. I got a place to pray. I got an altar that a deacon made for me years ago, 35 years ago in Henrietta, Texas. I've got that altar now in this place. I cleaned out the room. My wife and I, we, I told her I wanted to do this. And some ladies gave me a quilt, and I've got that quilt up. It's got a big cross in it. It helps me. Some things, a view right there, and some things on the wall. We, this movie came out called War Room. Amen. Uh, I made me a war room. And so I go in there, and I got my altar. And then at the foot of the altar, there's a round a lady in our church, a family gave it to me. And it, it's like, it looks like the lid that goes on a sewer. And you know my story of coming here that I sat on a sewer lid before and prayed till God called me here and said, if you'll be a worm, I'll use you out of Isaiah 41. And in that, they had it made for me and it looks like a sewer lid, but written on the sewer lid is not Pensacola or Dallas or what. It says wormology. Wormology. And so every day when I kneel down, I, I see that word and it reminds me, God will use a worm. what he told you. You came here 25 years ago. If you'd be a worm, I'd use you. A Bible to read, a place to pray, and then a friend to talk to. That's how you act like men. That's why we have these gatherings. I hope some of you will spin off a small group and begin to meet. J.T. Young's our deacon chairman. He's a, a, an ingenious idea he's come up with because of our 60 uh, deacons are, are divided into groups of three, 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 and three. And just to uh, illustrate the discipleship group, we've asked those men of threes that they meet together on a regular basis just to pray with one another, encourage one another, that they, they force themselves into that. Well, you ought to find you a group, some men, somewhere at a restaurant or at your home or on a Wednesday night at your church, somewhere that, that you're, you've got a friend to talk to. It'll help you as you grow up in the Lord. Be on the alert, stand firm in your faith, act like men. Number four, be strong, be strong. Fight the fight of faith. Now, men, listen to me. The noose is growing tighter around religious speech and expression in our culture. It's growing tighter and tighter. It is the express, written, Goal of the ACLU to take Christ out of government, law, education, and the workplace. They, they want to take the gospel, religion, out of government, law, education, and the workplace. You got to be strong. If you're going to be a Christian in the culture, 
I, I went to uh, the Chick-fil-A kickoff classic this year. And, and we're getting ready for the game. And they said, he's a big, you know, they brought out a flag, big as Texas. And everybody said, get ready for the national anthem. They said, just before the national anthem, we'd ask you to stand for prayer. And I, I said, what? Well, who pays for the Chick-fil-A bowl? Chickens do. <laughs> the Truett family pays. And so out steps Grant Taft, chairman of the college football rules committee. Man, he prayed down heaven. I was about to shout. I mean, it's like going back to Pisgah in 1964. Mr. Pruitt always prayed for a football game. You know, is this on? Oh, yeah, okay. Everybody stand up, be quiet, pray. We prayed for everything. We rarely pray before anything now. Why is it? I'm telling you, the move is there. Now, let me tell you, I, I'm concerned about prayer not being in these places, but I, I, I'd be pleased if we just got prayer back in the church. It, it'd help us a lot. And it might, if it begins here, it may go there. But you've got to learn to be strong because the noose is coming of forcing out of the government, out of the workplace, out of law, out of education. It was such really an odd deal that happened about the Planned Parenthood thing just a few days ago where the suit was about the people taking the lives of the children to sell the body parts and they wind up bringing an indictment against the people doing the journalism. When's the last time you ever heard of an undercover reporter getting sued? There's an agenda and the noose gets tight. Well, I'm not asking you to take a Bible and bash everybody. I'm just asking you when you have opportunity in your circle, and your culture, and, and when you have opportunity, stand firm, be strong. Listen to the book of Colossians, chapter 1 and verse 11, where Paul said, I've been strengthened with power according to his glorious might for the attaining of all patience and steadfastness. Steadfast. You that hear me all know, know that I use the word persist a great deal. I got that from my friend Andy Andrews who's spoken here for us before. Wow, what a wonderful layman. Writing New York Times bestsellers. And every time he signs a book, he signs it. Andy Andrews, persist, exclamation point. And I've stolen that. I write a card. If I'm writing Tommy this week, I'll write Tommy and tell him, thank you, and persist, Ted Trailer. It's a good word. We learn to be steadfast, be strong and stand. It's what men need to be doing in our culture. We can stand, stand, stand. being stout, be strong. And then he gives the capstone. Be on the alert, stand firm in faith, act like men, be strong. And then he gives the capstone in verse 14. Let all that you do be done in love. Love. Whew. Boy, did Quint help us with that. The compassion of others. Learning how to love yourself as he started and then learning how to share that with, with other people. That, that we do all in love. Paul said in this same book, now about a faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is Love. Why is love greater than faith and hope? Because it's the only thing that will endure. I'm going to a place where I won't have to have faith, where I won't have to have hope. In heaven, I don't have to have faith. I'm there. I don't have to have hope because I see. But love will endure forever. 
The greatest of these is love. And so we're to show that compassion. Mother Teresa, she said this, we can do no great things only small things with great love. I love that little phrase. We don't do great things. We just do small things with great love. On Tuesday night, I was at East Brent Baptist Church. The city of Pensacola faces, uh, next week we find out the wording, It's coming to the city council. It's what was known in Houston as the bathroom bill, the LBGT uh, culture and community asking uh, for this bill and uh, be about uh, whether it's written into this law or not. We're not sure, but we'll find it next week when the final writing is there and uh, whether or not transsexual can go into either bathroom and just that kind of thing. Man, that's so divisive. I, I'm, I pray that doesn't come. Our community doesn't need that. We, we've warred enough. But there are some things you have to stand on. I have two little granddaughters, three and one. They grow to be five and three and they go into a bathroom and Somebody comes in and, well, I'm just telling you, this granddaddy's going to be irate. That's not going to sit well with me. It'll be hard. So we have to deal with that. So the meeting at East Brent was, how are we going to deal with the bill? Well, we finished up and we got done and a gentleman over here stood up. He said, can I say a word? Colonel Holtzworthy, I could tell when I saw him, he was military. He had a tight cut, you know, he looked good. And this gentleman was a, a gay man. 23 years he served in the U.S. military. Great guy, dressed, looked sharp. And, and so he made the case a little bit for the other side. And here he was, outnumbered 200 to 1. So he spoke for a few minutes. He finished, and everything was fine. So we prayed, we got ready to leave. And the Holy Ghost talked to me. And I said, I ain't listening to this. And the Spirit of God said, I want you to find that gentleman. And I want you to shake his hand. And and I want you to speak a good word to him as a citizen of Escambia County. And I said, Lord, I don't want to. God ever ask you to do something you don't want to do? (laughs) And so I said, well. So there's a lot of people in there I knew, and I started milling around after the meeting talking. And all the while, I'm I'm looking for this guy. He's not there. And I'm beginning to rejoice in my spirit. (laughs) Well, okay, Lord, you know I was willing. I mean, I'd have done it. And so I, I stepped out the door. Bingo. He's standing there all by himself right outside the door. I think he's standing there to see if anybody talked to me. Nobody was. And I just stuck up my hand. I said, how you doing, sir? My name's Dale Patterson. No, not, not really, not, not really. Those of you who don't know, Brother Dale is the retired pastor at East Brent Baptist Church. And, uh, he wasn't at the meeting. No, I, I said, hey, how you doing? My, my name's Ted Trailer. And he told me his name. And I said, hey, I know it. Uh, that had to be a little uncomfortable in there tonight. And I know we're on different sides of this deal. But I said, I know that took courage to stand up like that. And I said, well, you know, we're just... We don't agree on a lot of stuff, but 
I just want you to know, in the name of my king, I love you. I'm telling you, I like to choke on that. (laughs) But guys, I'm here to tell you, God's not called us to hate people. God's called us to love some folk. And the Bible says to speak the truth. What's the rest of that? In love. In love. And you've heard me. You know, you can speak truth. Now, if you just want somebody to tell the truth, you got the right guy right here, all right? If I don't have to love you, <laughs> I'll put some truth on you, all right? <laughs> or if you just want me to love you without having to deal with with conviction. But I'm telling you, only the Spirit of God can bring love and conviction and put that together and make it to be. Well, that's who Jesus is. That's who Jesus was and is. He, He speaks that through us. That's who and what we're to be in this world. On alert, Firm in faith, like a man grown, strong, doing all in love. As 1 Corinthians 14, 1 says, pursue love. Pursue it. Go after it. You remember. How many of you in here are single? How many single guys we got here tonight? Pretty good smattering of single guys. Amen. Amen. How many of you are married and, and your wife is still living? You're, you're married now. Just raise your hand. Okay. Do you remember when you pursued her? Remember that part? Amen. Uh, that's good, wasn't it? Hey, don't stop now. Keep pursuing her. Single guys, pursue her. You, you, you hunt. And you remember, and it's harder today because you ride in the car and there's all kind of stuff in there, you know. <laughs> in the 60s, it's easy. A <laughs> little curve, you know, and start over. And <laughs> leather seat and a polyester skirt and... She's right there, baby, I'm telling you. And you're, you remember the first time you tried, you didn't know if you should hold her hand or not? And you, yeah. Remember when you thought about, maybe I'm gonna kiss her for the first time. You, you pursued that. There was, the word of God says, pursue love. And I'm telling you guys, you ought to go after Jesus. That's what you pursue. You pursue the Lord in intimacy. You want to know him. Make your palms sweat. Cause your heart to flutter. (laughs) But pursuing love always moves you 